What, uh, one, of the, one of the things we'd like to ask our presenters uh, this afternoon is maybe what, what is your personal strategy for disciple making, the strategy that you have for your church in disciple making, some of the challenges in, in implementing and developing that strategy. Maybe you could just share just a little bit about that strategy that, that you want to use not only personally, but in the life of your church. Are we starting on this end this time? That'd be fine. <laughs> um, you know, it was told to me when, when I was first being discipled that if you give me a thousand different people, I do it a thousand different ways. And I think there is a degree to which uh, the process um, is mandated a little bit by where the person is when they come into the process. There are some non-negotiables that, that I want someone to emerge uh, with uh, at the result of the process. Um, and so you have aspects like being able to, to, to handle the word, um, how to, how to self-feed, the spiritual disciplines, uh, how to walk victoriously in the Lord. Um, you know, the, the necessity of the local body is a laboratory by which we grow and have the opportunity to hone spiritual gifts and invest in the lives of others. I think that's, that's an essential. Uh, but you also have the aspect of, uh, of having a world vision and a strategy by which to impact the world and, and truly fulfill that, uh, that commission that we've been given. And so I want to see a disciple emerge with all of those characteristics um, and, and even when it comes down to, to, you know, to what we teach, I think there's a lot of leeway in when it comes to curriculum and those kind of things. But there, there have to be at least four qualities, I believe, of, of something that's handed off in a strategy. It needs to be biblical. Um, it needs to be simple. It needs to be cross-cultural. And it needs to be reproducible. Because if, I am in, if, I'm, if I'm investing in, uh, in one of my guys and I'm telling them you know, that our task is to make disciples of all nations, then I should be able to parachute them into the furthest reaches of Sudan and take what they've been given and be able to start a movement there. And I want, them, I want this round table, you know, to, to be the starting place for that. And so, um, you know, kind of going back to the way we study the Word, it, biblical, simple, reproducible, cross-cultural. And, um, you know, as we study the Word, study the world, they become more equipped to be able to take what they're given there and then reproduce it wherever God puts them, whether it be, whether it be in the community uh, ad adjacent to ours or if he plucks them up and moves them to the other end of the world. Did I come close to answering your question? You did, uh, and, and boy, some of the key terms that you used were, did you pick up on investment? Disciple making is an investment where you not only expect a, a, a return on your, or a dividend, uh, but you also uh, expect that return on the base amount that you put into them as well. Uh, reproducible is one thing that Robbie mentioned earlier. Uh, we want what we do to be reproduced in the lives of those that we're investing in. And one of the things that you will hear over and over again is we want disciples who will make disciples who will make disciples. And then as Scott mentioned, according to 2 Timothy 2, 2, up to at least four generations. So, Brother Steve, tell us a little bit about your strategy. Yeah, our strategy uh, involves a lot of group work. It really does. And so when we look at it, we really look at our strategy in five different ways. So, we want people to be either involved in a life group, connected to a group of people. And that life group is important to us just because that's where the ministry happens. It's where the prayer happens. So we begin to have those practice of some of those things. In our life group, it's where community happens. So we talked about relationships earlier. And so we're going to help people get connected, not only to the group, but to the church and to their place of service. It's where we're going to teach, but we're going to teach for transformation versus information. And so many times it's just get that list of biblical facts. But for us, we want to teach in such a way that it literally is changing a, a person's life. And then lastly, uh, in that life group, we want folks involved in evangelism and mission, serving outside the walls, being the hands and the feet of Jesus. On a personal note, uh, the way I invest is I invest in interns and residents right now. And because training and equipping leaders who in turn can go out to regional campuses or literally will to wherever in the world and be able to serve and to be equipped to lead. So we have strategies in place uh, to do that. And um, also in our strategy, in addition to just a life group or that group focus, we really do think that there's room for apologetics. So we do focus studies. We do intense studies there. We have a, an interesting thing that uh, it came out of a, just our thinking about the business and the professional world that's traveling. Uh, how do we make disciples of them? 
So we have a self-guided strategy, and now we're trying to connect that using some of the uh, digital media. Mentor relationships is a big key of our strategy where we invest one-on-one -on -one in mentoring and coaching. So those are some of the key components of the strategy that we use to make disciples. Well, you guys have got a lot of different ways and you can do that then, uh, not only in your personal life, but in your church as well. Robbie, how about, how about you? So um, what, what, what you will find in any church is that if the pastor is not intentional about making disciples, then discipleship becomes a ministry in the church, and it will never become the ministry of the church. And that's a big difference, because it's another program, and the pastor just sees it as another add-on. See, see, discipleship is way more than, you know, people hear discipleship, it's four guys sitting in a room singing hymns and, and, and spiritual songs with one another, and us four and no more. It's way more than that, as you said earlier. It's, it's a van true biblical discipleship is where evangelism flows into discipleship. Discipleship flows into evangelism. It's, it's a both hand. So as a pastor, I was at, uh, I went to Pastor Brainerd Baptist Church, 80-something-year-old church. I'm a young pastor, young, youngest pastor in the history of the church that went there. Uh, choir, orchestra, pretty, pretty um, con, you know, conservative, really respected church. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Sunday school, Wednesday night. And I was, uh, the first year, instead of telling them to go out and get involved in these small discipleship groups, I led by example. And here's, here, here's the thing you've got to remember as a leader. You can't expect what you don't emulate. Okay? You can't expect from others what you're not emulating yourself. Okay? So we can't say, you know, we have no power when we say, hey, you need to get in the Word until the Word gets into you, and we're not even reading the Bible. You guys need to meet for the cottage home prayer meetings, but I'm not going to meet for prayer. There's no power of that. But out of the overflow, you know, you're ministering out of the overflow, so you can't expect what you don't emulate. So I decided on Wednesday night I was going to go mentor four guys in my office. And that was the shot across the bot. Why in the world, Pastor, would you leave a group of 100-plus men and women, mostly senior saints, to teach them another lesson? And what I said is I got a young pastor here who would love to teach, and I think my time's more effectively used investing in four men. Now, let me tell you something. Out of those four, three of those men right now came out of the secular world and in, are in full-time ministry. One's in India. One left uh, the world as a pilot, and I'm not saying this happens every time, but it happened in this group. One left, uh, he was a pilot, and he's now on staff at Brainerd, and the other guy's got his D-men uh, from Piedmont. Uh, so I felt like that was an effective strategy to invest in them. Here's the second thing. When people in the church don't know what to do, they don't do anything. Yeah. Wouldn't you agree? So our people, want, well, you would agree with me, most people in the church want to grow closer to Jesus. Born-again believers want a deeper walk with Christ. Here's the problem. They don't know what to do. And we can't expect people to connect the dots. It's very difficult for them. To, why, why, they, got, they got children, they got basketball, they got football, they got, they got work, they got, they got home issues, they got financial issues. They can't, we can't expect them to connect the dots. So when they don't know what to do, they don't know what to do. Here's the flip side. When there's too much to do in the church, they don't know what to do. I was at a Membership Matters class years ago. We told them all the great things that were, hap that were happening at Brainerd. At the end of the meeting, a girl in the back uh, raised her hand. I mean, we're talking about children's ministry and preschool ministry and overseas ministry and inner city ministry and, and homeless ministry and, and every ministry you can think of. And at the end, the college student in the back raised her hand. She said, she said, Pastor, I am so excited to be joining this church. She said, but here's a question. Where do I start? I said, well, that's easy. You're a college student. I said, we're the college men. Well, actually, no. I'd actually start in a life group. But if you don't know anybody in a life group, then you need to be committed to the service. And if you don't know anybody's service, you might want to. But you could serve in preschool or you can go in the inner city. And I realized I didn't even know what to tell this girl. Now, here's the thing. Think about your church. What, what we've done in the church is we have so many options. And we wonder why people don't do anything. Why? Because they suffer from analysis paralysis. They don't know what to do, right? So what we did is, and I don't want to steal um, his thunder, but we, I, did a, I did a cursory study of the New Testament years ago. It's funny, he and I were talking. What he's about to share with you is exactly, it's just what Jesus did, so it's not anything, I tell people this is nothing new. Uh, Jesus ministered in five groups, and what we felt like is we could impact with three. So this is the three groups we tell, we say you can do anything you want at Long Hollow, but want you to be in three. In the, in the large gathering, in the life group, and in the D group, okay? I'll tell you a quick story and I'll pass the mic. I, I was coming up with this model years ago, went and talked to Bill Hall. Anybody familiar with Bill Hall, uh, disciple-making pastor, New Century Discipleship? 
Bill's a mentor and a friend. I was in LA with Bill, and uh, I said, Bill, you're never gonna believe this. I got this great idea. Large gathering, life group gathering, D group gathering. I said, what do you think? I said, we're calling it the disciple making pathway. Bill's like, that's great. <clears throat> he said, the only problem is John Wesley did that in 1750. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, no, that model's been around from 1750. I said, I said, I've never even heard of this. He said he called it societies, classes, and bands. Has anybody ever heard of this before? I've rarely had Baptist pastors say yes, rarely, because most people haven't heard of this. It's a Methodist idea. In 1750, John Wesley started this idea, societies, classes, and bands. And what he did was he knew that just getting people in the worship service was not enough, so he moved them to the classes. And the classes were 12 to 15, 20 people for the purpose of accountability. They didn't sit in rows. They sat in circles. And in order to go to church, you had to have a ticket. Did you, you, you think about this? You had to have a ticket to get in church. And so people would come to church and say, hey, look, this is the Joneses. Hey, do you all have your tickets? And they'd say, no, we don't have tickets. And they'd say, go to class. This is what they're telling, right? So they had to go to class to get tickets. Now, I tried to do this at Brainerd years ago. My staff said, pastor, you're going to kill our church. And so we didn't, we didn't do it back then, but, but I thought about it. But then he said, that's not where life happens. You have to go even further to the bands, which were five to seven, men with men, gender exclusive for the purpose of reproduction and accountability. You ready for this? With that model, he started it in 1750. By 1820, Methodism, go back and study it, in America comprised 30% of the American population. Every three out of 10 Americans said they were Methodist. And it outplaced the closest one by 20%. Okay, how did he do it? He had a simple, reproducible system that anybody can be involved in. And so that's basically, I, I, I know uh, we're going to hear about Erupt from Scott, but that's basically a simple, reproducible model. And I think people don't know what to do because they don't know what to do. And they, they don't do anything at all. So. And I love your comment about the pastor. The, mo the pivotal point at our church that happened was in a staff meeting. Uh, I told you, Gavin and I, we both walked through this doctoral process together. We were getting at the same time, and the point was we didn't, we didn't care about a degree. We needed to fix a problem. See, in our church, we grew from 2002 to 2008. We grew from 250 to 700 in active attendance. Okay, brought in an average of 170 people per year. 2008 to 2013, we still brought in 179 people per year, but there was no measurable growth. You almost have to be kicking people out of the church not to have any measurable growth in bringing in 179 people a year. And we knew there was a problem, so that's what we jumped into. And I said, Lord, I, I need something that's memorable, that our people can be passionate about, that they can reproduce, but I need something that works. I just need something that works. So this, this whole process um, started with that, and we're sitting in a staff meeting. Uh, we about halfway through our doctoral program, and then Gavin, he stopped, and he said, we're going to be making the shift from being an evangelistic church to becoming a disciple-making church. And we talked about what that, that meant, and I threw out the two-wheel bicycle idea. And he said, probably the person who's going to have to change the most in this process is me. And he pointed to himself. And when he realized that as a pastor who evangelism bled through every pore of his body, knew that he had to make the shift, that it couldn't just be about that, and then I, I got him where we talked about discipleship. He started discipling groups. We worked this whole process out. But that's where the shift happened. Now, listen, pastors, let me just encourage you with something. You're the under-shepherd of the bride. You're not the groom. I'm, I'm fearful in a lot of our churches that we're building presidents and we're building CEOs who own the church. And we don't own the church. We're going to be held accountable for what we do with the bride one day when we stand before the groom. So I hope that you're chewing on this and you're wrestling with it. Let me, let me briefly let's just walk this uh, through you with this. Um, there's, there's five levels of it. The E is the everyone level. Okay, This is Jesus, John 6. He walks in. He's in that area of Galilee, and he's speaking. The crowd gathers around. He speaks that to the large group. Okay, This is where you share vision. This is For us, it's that Sunday morning deal, okay? The pastor is able to give vision. He's able to be able to lead from the pulpit. But in this area, this is where people begin saying, man, I'm, I'm starting to get it. So when Robbie stands in front of all those folks there at Long Hollow on that Sunday morning, there's folks in there who don't know Jesus. Maybe they've never heard. This is where the Spirit of God is beginning to work. And man, there's something to this, this Jesus deal. Now, in the, the second level, this is the real life. Okay, you may call it Sunday school. We call it life groups. It's that Sunday morning Bible study, that, that 12 to 15. And to be honest with you, half our groups are not 12 to 15. They're mid-sized groups. 
Our small groups are 20 to 50 in some of those classes, and we're working hard uh, to do some things there. But in this real-life level here, I was looking at, the, at the, the scriptures about Jesus, same deal, where Jesus had a model, he had a method of what he went through. Did Jesus have a group of 12? And sure he did. He, he modeled that, um, that disciple's life in front of them. He did life with them. They could ask questions of him. How, they watched how he responded to things. He taught them, but he also engaged them in ministry. So that, that real life level here is where it's focused. There's fellowship, there's Bible study, but there's also heavy evangelism in our real life layer here. These first two, we, we go heavy, heavy in evangelism. The you is the uninhibited group. I call it the naked self. This is where you peel back some of those layers. For us, it's groups of three or four, and it's gender specific. Now, I give them a curriculum that they're working through. Okay, I don't, I don't launch them by themselves because my, my thought is with a curriculum, it will help you go from a point A to point B with a group that may not be skilled in taking themselves there. So we know what they're studying. We know where they're headed in these curriculum groups. Um, got a call last night. Laura just launched one uh, back in January. There's three of them in the group. They know that in the next 18 to 24 months that they're expected to reproduce that. In our groups, we go too deep in our multiplication of those groups uh, so that we stay. And here's one of the things that, that we've, we found. I was in a group of five people in my office, and I asked them this question. These are the most respected, s- strongest believers in the church, memorizing Scripture, engaged in every aspect of what you do. And I said, do you have a 2 a.m. friend? Four of the five of the most respected closest people to Jesus in the church didn't have a 2 a.m. friend. I said, I'm not talking about your spouse. I'm talking about when your spouse leaves or dies or things fall apart, you have somebody you can call. They didn't have them. So I said, what are we doing in our churches? We're trying to do that. We're finding in our, in our journey groups is what we call them in this uninhibited level. This is where those people are forming those 2 a.m. friends, those family members that they're saying, I'm closer to them than I am my brother or my own sister. And then this next layer is the private devotion. And this one disturbs me because most of the people, and it's so refreshing to hear you talk about one, a personal walk with Jesus because I'm going to tell you, in the last three years, I've been to almost every major disciple-making conference in the country. Okay, and I'm going to another one next weekend. And I've yet to hear a main stage speaker make this statement that your personal walk with Jesus is foundational in any disciple-making process. Every one of them's got layers. They all talk about um, the different groups. They emphasize large group or they emphasize small group, but I haven't heard anybody talk about my personal walk with Jesus. And listen to me, friends. I don't care what strategy you have. If you're not operating out of the overflow of what God's doing in you, you don't have anything to give. You're manufacturing that. That means it's fake, and we can't do that in our groups. And the last layer is transformation. That's the product that we want with our people. We want to transform life that's different that are people that are taking on the character of Christ in a culture that doesn't understand that, the people that they're asking, I mean, what's, what's, what's different? There's something not right about What's different about you? And it's not that you're a vegetarian. It's that Jesus has changed you, and then it gives you a platform to say, let me tell you about that. So that's our, that's our process, Casey, that we go through. And we tried to make it real memorable because I told our folks, I want you with your neighbor, with the guy next to you in the pew, and the guy in the cubicle beside you at, at the point of impact, on demand, I want you to be able to reproduce what I'm saying to you right now with the E-R-U-P-T. 